Well, hello everybody, Mike here with Hardware Canucks. And ever since the Ryzen 7000 series were launched a couple of weeks ago, was it a couple of weeks ago? Yes. It's all a blur. There has been a constant, constant discussion about the temperatures they run at. A lot of people in our comment threads, in other videos are simply saying they run too hot, but it's a lot more nuanced than that. And that is exactly what I wanted to tackle in this video, but do it from a little bit of a different perspective. So instead of completely bookending all of our testing with the absolute highest end cooling solution that we could possibly find and comparing that to a garbage, trashy, out of the box heatsink, I wanted to take a little bit more of a nuance approach to this whole thing and that means testing with a bunch of different coolers and seeing how these CPUs behave straight out of the box so I've got a couple lined up for you there is going to be the 240 millimeter AIO a 120 millimeter AIO there's going to be a 7 uh, the LS 720 which is a 360 millimeter AIO and I'm gonna run out of space here very very soon there is also going to be a Bargain heatsink, the AK400 from Deepcool that costs just 30 bucks. And finally, one of the best coolers that we've tested in a while, the AK620 from Deepcool. Look at that. There you go. There is my lineup right now. And the camera guy is laughing behind the camera because he's like, where's my shot going? So anyways, let's take a look at how things set up here. Starting right off with the behavior people are seeing on these chips compared to the last generation in an all core workload. When paired up with the Deepcool AK620 running at just 50% fan speed. And over the course of a 10 minute render, the temperature delta between the Ryzen 9 5950X and 7950X is absolutely Absolutely massive to the tune of 35 degrees. It looks like the 7950X just beats on the AK620 like it owes it money, whereas the older CPU is a hell of a lot easier to cool even with the fans running at half speed. The 5600X, 7600X situation isn't any different with the newer chip showing a 30 degree temperature increase. And based on that, it really does look like these processors run hot, but there is actually a reason for that. And that is because AMD is trying to maximize the amount of performance. I mean, I could go on and on, but I wanna actually let one of their quotes that they sent to me explain everything. So basically what's being said here is that the 7000 series is designed to maximize temperatures and power headroom in order to hit the best performance possible. That's why the 7950X gets pegged at 95 degrees and even the 7600X starts getting up there relative to the 5000 series. But is this cause for concern? Well, seeing 95 degrees might come as an absolute shock for desktop users. Anyone who's familiar with our laptop temperature testing will know this is exactly, exactly the way mobile CPUs have been operating for the longest time. Striving to reach 95 degrees here is by design. But there's another factor here and that is the way these processors are actually physically designed. It is a very, very large contributor to the temperatures that we're seeing and the behavior that we're seeing. Let me explain a little bit more. Both the 7950X and 7900X have a pair of CCDs parked right next to one another, which when combined can chug back 220 watts on the 7950X. And that leads to a crap ton of heat output in a small area, concentrated right at the very, very edge of the IHS. The 7600X and 7700X on the other hand are in a very different situation with a single CCD, but that little guy can output a good 110 to 135 watts of heat. In a traditional situation with a thin IHS, you get all that concentrated heat transferred right back up into the CPU cooler's base with a minimum of dispersion. Yet with the 7000 series, the IHS thickness has gone from three millimeters on the 5000 series to what is now 4.25 millimeters. Now, according to AMD, this was done to keep AM4 cooler compatibility. And I know this has been made to sound like a completely bad thing, but it can also be a benefit in some cases too. Take heat sinks with heat pipe direct touch or HDT bases, for example. With a thin IHS transferring heat directly upwards, they would have fared terribly, especially with single CCD designs, since some of their heat pipes wouldn't even touch the IHS right above the cores. So instead of projecting Projecting heat right upwards into the cooler through a thin IHS, the thickness allows for, I guess you'd call it like a pre-distribution and dispersion of extreme temperatures from the CPU itself without having to worry about the heat sinks type of base becoming too much of a limiting factor. But this setup actually does have a double-edged sword effect too. 
Basically, that thick-ass IHS is not very efficient at pulling the heat away from those cores quickly. It actually soaks up a lot, a lot of the heat that's being generated by these processors. And what that does is a theory called heat soak. Basically, some of that heat will not be sent directly up into the cooler. It will soak right back into the CPU itself. You can actually see an example of this in the first 150 seconds right here. While the 5000 series has a gradual increase in temperatures while the heat gets dumped directly to the AK620, the 7000 series has an almost immediate spike as the IHS becomes a limiting factor and temperatures remain pretty much constant through the whole test. Basically, it puts any cooler a step behind from the very beginning. So obviously there's a bottleneck going on here and it is not necessarily your CPU cooler. Guess what? And Der Bauer pretty much proved that when he did some direct die cooling on the 7000 series CPUs. You can actually find that video right up here. It's very, very, very well done. But you know what won't cause a bottleneck to your gaming? It's these Cooler Master gaming monitors. Oh yes, I've always wanted to be inside one of these. 27 inches of pure Dimitri Pixels. You can kind of see into my soul. Oh, what's this behind me? Just a 576 mini LED zone for gorgeous exposure and <laughs> HDR performance with the 1200 nit peak brightness. Feel the immersion in reality with the new 4K 160 Hz mini LED monitor, the Cooler Master GP27U, bringing everything to life. Anyways, what does this mean for how coolers behave in this? And I really have to give Deep Cool a shout out here because they were kind enough to send every single one of their current coolers so we could sort of do an apples to apples comparison. And let's start off by looking at the 7950X temperatures. And at first it looks pretty bleak if you're looking just at raw temperatures alone, since at half fan speed, even the biggest cooler here fails to get under that 90 degree mark. Even with fans running at full chooch factor, there's not much of a change. Everything under that 240 millimeter AIO hits AMD's TJ Maxx point of 95 degrees. The 7600X fares a little bit better since every cooler here can keep that chip well below 95 degrees without too much of a problem, even at ultra low fan speeds. But the relatively small 12 degree delta between a basic air cooler running at 50% and a high end 360 millimeter AIO running at 100% fan speed points towards the cooler type becoming almost irrelevant. Now at this point, a lot of folks, they would probably look at those numbers and simply say that the 7000 series runs hot. But do you need a 360 millimeter expensive all-in-one liquid cooler to get the best out of these chips outside of temperatures? The answer to that is no, probably not. In order to go a little bit deeper, I want to actually look at the clock speeds that these CPUs were getting under different types of thermal load. Because seeing how temperatures relate directly to clock speeds is oh so important. Under a full core load, 82 degrees was the absolute lowest we saw on the 7950X. And that got an average clock speed of about 5.2 gigahertz. And as temperature ramps up, frequencies do of course drop, but not as much as you might expect. Even at 92 degrees, the chip is still hitting 5.1 gigahertz and finally ended up at around 5.07 gigahertz at 95 degrees. Now, if we overlay how coolers perform here in relation to temperatures and clock speeds, we've got the 360 millimeter AIO that lands about here. The lower mark indicates the coolest it got at full fan speeds, while the higher mark shows the temperatures at 50% fan speed and everything else in between is between those two speeds. There's also a big, big log jam right at the chip's TJ Maxx point of 95 degrees. But you might have noticed in that last chart that both the $30 AK400 and the 240 millimeter AIO were at 95 degrees. Does that mean that they were actually performing the same? No, absolutely not, because there's so much more to it than that. To prove it, let's put this little guy at 50% fan speed on a 7950X. This might be a 10 minute test, but right away you can see there's a direct correlation between the time spent at the 95 degree point and lower clocks as the minutes tick by. Spend more time at TJ Maxx 
with a cooler that can't remove the thermal buildup fast enough and the CPU will gradually cut back performance. It isn't immediate either because those first two and a half minutes of the test show it takes the 7950X a solid minute or so to gradually settle at a point of about 150 or so megahertz lower than where it began. And that's just a snapshot of the AK620 operating at 50% fan speed. What happens if we add all of these coolers to it and hit it with a 15 minute test. Are there gonna be any differences? At 100% fan speed, the LS320, AK620, and AK400 all showed 95 degrees, but there are some minor frequency differences. At 50% fan speed, there's a little bit more variance from one to another, but overall, there's a maximum drop off of about 200 megahertz. Just to put this into context of raw performance in a rendering workload, the difference between the best and worst CPU cooler in these charts is, Pretty small actually. Even when you compare a budget heatsink running at low fan speeds against a 360 millimeter AIO going balls to the wall, the gap is less than a minute over a 16 minute render. And look, I don't want you to think that this is me telling you to completely cheap out on a cooling solution. No way, get the best that you can afford, period. All I'm saying and leveling with you here is to explain that there might be a lot less doom and gloom than some of you actually believe, at least on the 7950X, because the 7600X, that's a completely different animal. Because comparing temperatures to clocks, this processor is affected a lot more than its big brother, since it sticks to 5.4 gigahertz all the way to 70 degrees. But after that, frequencies tend to drop like a stone. By the time it hits 84 degrees, we're at 5.3 gigahertz, 88 degrees sees another 100 megahertz cutback and so on. Afterwards, it continues to fall down to 5.15 and then in an absolute worst case scenario, it'll knock itself back to five gigahertz after sticking to 95 degrees for a little while. So the sweet spot for performance under a full core load would be anything under 84 degrees here. So let's drop our coolers into this chart showing their performance ranges between 50 and 100% fan speeds. Of course, the 360 and 240 millimeter AIOs get the best results, but even the 120 millimeter one and AK620 keep things in that 84 degree sweet spot. The AK400, well, it's a budget cooler that still keeps the 7600X well above its base clock, and you'd still only be losing about 100 megahertz over top end solutions. And what does this mean for performance of our coolers? Well, once again, there's really not that much of a difference between the high end and entry level heat sinks in an intensive multi-core workload. I mean, we're talking about less than 90 seconds over a 30 minute test. And I also have to say that a lot of you guys probably aren't in this scenario that I'm showing right now and that a lot of other people tend to show. You are not running a multi-core high level rendering workloads on these CPUs. What are you doing? You're probably gaming, you're probably doing word processing. I mean, hell, 7950X for word processing, best processor out there. But seriously, let's talk about how these behave when in a typical gaming scenario. And for that, I took the average of six games to see what kind of temperatures and what kind of performance you can expect. On the 7950X, not a single one of these coolers gets anywhere close to the temperatures they were getting during that all core workload. And full speed fans bring them even lower, though I'm sure you've got one question here. Is there any effect on frame rates? At 100% fan speed, the answer to that is no, no, no. Not one iota when you take the margin of error into account on these numbers. Every one of these gives you identical gaming performance on a 7950X. Even dropping the fans to 50% gives you identical frame rates right across the board. The coolers are all getting the exact same numbers and these are literal carbon copy of the full speed results. And of course, the 7600X posts even lower results with the AK400 and AK620 hitting an average of 60 degrees or less after 30 minutes of gaming. Gaming frame rates follow the exact same path as they did with the 7950X. There's no performance difference between the heat sinks or when going from high speed to low speed fan profiles. Personally, I think these gaming results point towards the most important takeaway from this video. You simply need to understand your usage case before just assuming you need the absolute highest end cooling solution. For gaming, even an AK400, a $30 CPU cooler, kept the 7950X under 75 degrees 
series at super quiet fan speeds. But if you constantly pound away on your CPU with multi-core workloads, anything that you saw in the gaming results can be completely pushed aside. In those types of scenarios, you're really gonna wanna look at higher end cooling solutions for every single one of AMD's new processors. Personally though, we can talk about temperatures all day, but what really excites me is the fact that the Ryzen 7000 series and to a lesser extent Raptor Lake that you're gonna see in a little bit are going to turn CPU cooler testing methodologies on their freaking heads. That's because desktop CPUs nowadays are acting more and more like the processors that we've seen on the laptop side for such a long time. They're trying to almost work against the cooling solution in order to push temperatures and power to their utmost limits in order to get the best possible performance. So suddenly having a great CPU cooler is going to come down to actual frequencies and performance. So we're gonna see how that affects all of our testing going forward. Anyways, I'm Mike with Hardware Canucks. I hope you liked this one. And if you did, I can't wait to see you in the next one.